I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. Guaranteed, I won't talk too long or they will object. <laughs> you know, we, we practice baptism by immersion, which means we dunk you. And we don't want to dunk the babies, but we want to join with the parents in their desire to see their children grow up in the Christian faith. So we anoint them with oil, and I'm going to ask you to join me in a prayer for them. And then when they're old enough to make that decision for themselves, I hope we get to be together again for their baptism in water. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Children are a big part of what we do around here. And this is a beautiful representation. We've got another group this large or so in the morning. So if you think that um, the church is not strong and growing, you're not paying attention. This is church growth the old-fashioned way. Huh? Now, it takes courage to parent these days, and we want to join with them in asking for God to lead them and give them wisdom and the courage they will need to see these young lives become pillars in the kingdom of God. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for these children. I thank you for their lives and the great gift that they are into these families. You are the author of life, and you knew these children before any of us had ever seen them. 
And Father, we stand with these parents tonight and ask that you would watch over these young lives. May they grow strong, body, soul, and spirit. Father, may their angels keep them safe. May there be an anointing upon them to take their place in your kingdom. And may they be a blessing to these families all the days of their lives. I pray for the parents and the families around them that they would have wisdom and courage and the strength that they need. May their homes be a place of peace and unity where the name of Jesus is honored and the word of God is available. I thank you that they will grow strong together and strong in you. And we will celebrate those victories with them as the years pass. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You better give them a hand, huh? What a beautiful group of folks. They're going to have service over in Genesis tonight. And if it's too sedate in here for you, and you want to go someplace where there's a little more movement, a little more activity, a little bit of noise, and you can pass the background check, we'll let you in Genesis. <laughs> yes, once they find themselves on the screens, we have lost control officially. You know, we do a full menu of age-graded children's activities at every worship service, Wednesday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. And that's possible because of you, the people in this place that serve the children. Um, there is no mysterious closet where the church lives. It's us. And if we want a different attitude or a different strength for our children and our young families, it's because we're willing to invest the time and energy to see that happen. So I thank you. I know there are hundreds of you that serve children and students in this place. And without your diligence and your effort and your sacrifice, uh, it just wouldn't be possible. So I thank you for that. All right, hello church. Hello. We had winter again, but it's gone. It's gonna be what, 80 on Thursday? It's Tennessee, we can have all four seasons in any week, often in a day. And when that's happening, the weather people just feel left out, so they start announcing storms. <laughs> and we close a random school or two. It just makes us feel better about ourselves. It snowed somewhere. Let's close the school. But I pray you are safe, and the Lord kept you through the, next, the last two days of winter. Uh, it is good to be with God's people. Um, for our offertory prayer, I want to ask you to pray with me. I bet you've... There's a lot going on in the world. It just, it's impossible to keep up with it, to be honest. To keep up, I have to spend more time in the news than I'm willing to. So I, I just kind of like news hors d'oeuvres. I just need some snippets of what's going on. I was amused this week at the, the interest we have in weather balloons. <laughs> the the cost-benefit in removing them, we haven't sorted that out quite yet. But um, that got a lot of attention. But on, on the positive side of the ledger, um, there is some sense of an awakening or a revival not too far north of us at Asbury in Kentucky. Amen. Not a lot of details about that, and they don't need to be. It's not really our business, other than to celebrate what God is doing. Probably the best thing I heard was that a, a, a news reporter was willing to go and give a report, and they asked him not to. And I thought that was encouraging. Um, I'll give you a, uh, you know, what God will do with that, I don't know. I'm, I'm grateful to celebrate every life that has changed and any momentum that brings. And if it makes the idea of a revival more prominent in the public um, consciousness, I think that's a big win. Um, and I, I want to pray for that as our offertory prayer tonight. But I would give you a note or two. As we walk this forward, it's inevitable that there will be um, multiplied stories about revivals elsewhere. And there's some things that I would tell you, I think, are characteristic of every true revival. Because one of the things we've learned is that the, the, the real and the false are going to flourish together in this season. And, and revival is, emerges out of a heartfelt, spirit-initiated sense of repentance. When you hear that people are deeply and genuinely repenting 
and that's about a change of mind and a change of behavior, you know that's evidence of the Spirit of God moving. And when that's absent, it, 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 it's something different. And I'm not saying it isn't happening at Asbury. I, I, I have every indication to believe it is. But I'm telling you, that's kind of messy business when people in a real serious way begin to repent. It's disruptive on a lot of levels. Years ago, some of you may do enough church history. I was at ORU, O. Roberts University, when Keith Green came and the revival of sorts began there with some kind of public repentance. And uh, it was messy stuff. And um, so we need to pray for the folks at Asbury. But more than that, we need to pray that God would send a spirit of repentance and the fear of God upon our nation. Amen. Huh? I, I think it's perfectly logical that repentance would begin with the people of God. That, that's where we have to begin. So it's very hopeful to me, and I think your prayers are an important part of that. Wouldn't it be wonderful to celebrate that on campus after campus after campus? A change in, in moral behaviors, a change in ethics, a change in the courses that are enrolled in and those that aren't. Yes. That's what we're watching for. That's what it will look like. Jesus be welcomed back. We'll be intolerant of people in a, in a setting where they're supposed to honor him and they don't. To have seminaries and theological training institutions that denigrate Jesus and diminish the authority of the word of God is reprehensible. And we're going to have to repent to see it change at place after place after place after place. We have embraced it for too long. I have been in too many of those settings. So I'm thrilled to see what has begun and I pray it grows and multiplies. Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you stand with me for that prayer? If you're at home, you can stand with us. Put your pizza down. Now I meet people all over the country. They say, we stand when you stand. <laughs> Good. We stand to honor the Lord out of respect and reverence for him. We lost a bit of that. You know, the culture's a lot more casual, and I'm okay with that. We even communicate in 22 characters or less. But, but God is not casual, and he deserves our respect. Amen. Deserves our attention, our focus, our very best efforts. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I thank you that you are alive and well in the earth, that the church of Jesus Christ is gaining strength. We praise you tonight that Jesus of Nazareth is the head of the church. And your spirit is alive and well within us throughout the earth. And I thank you for the good reports that have come from Asbury, for the message of revival that has begun, and the hunger in the hearts of the young people to, to worship you and to acknowledge you and to, to express a desire to honor you more fully than they ever have before. Father, I pray that you will direct and guide all that's done. Protect them from anything that would diminish or dampen or turn aside what you desire to happen in that place. Lord, may it grow. May it spread to town upon town and city upon city and campus after campus and school upon school and congregation after congregation. May we humble ourselves and cry out to you in humility and repentance. May the fear of God grow in our hearts. We thank you, Father, where we have been tolerant of wickedness and evil, where we have participated in it and given our assent to it, Father. May we humble ourselves and cry out to you for mercy and forgiveness. We thank you for it today. We praise you for the good news. Lord, for the truth that is being told, that the name of Jesus is being lifted up, that you're being discussed in places where you have been ignored. We give you glory tonight. We praise you that greater is the one who is with us than all the forces arrayed against us. We thank you that through the blood of Jesus, we have been delivered out of the hand of the enemy, that his power is broken over our lives that you're bringing your church back to life with new energy, with new authority from you. We praise you for it today. We bless your name. We give you glory and honor, for it's in Jesus' name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. This upcoming campaign is the Sanctuary of Scripture and we're uh, very excited to see what the Lord is gonna do in this campaign. 
we want to change our culture and if we can uh, uh, influence children and their parents towards uh, biblical principles, I'm excited about it and I want to be a part of it. I'm excited with that name, Sanctuary of Scripture. I think that's going to be great and I'm excited to see the completion of this. And we're going to be praying, asking the Lord, what should we give? What should we do? And I definitely want to be a part because I know the Lord is in it. Yeah, I was here when we talked about the campaign for the Promised Land. For that, we built two sanctuaries, New Harvest and All Nations. I have seen over many campaigns how much it opens up doors for others to come to know the Lord. And that's the most important thing. to my best friends, I would say to them, invest in God's kingdom. It's the greatest investment a human being can ever make. And the results are so um, plentiful and fruitful in one's own life. Amen. If you're doing the math in 2001, I was at least 11, so you can figure all that out. Okay, so, yeah. We are in the beginning of a plan to expand our campus and facilities. And so the Sanctuary of Scripture is the name we have given to that project. And so to do that, we've been remembering a little bit about the journey. Uh, that's important. Without those points and understanding from our past, it's very difficult to negotiate a pathway forward. You know, it is normal, it's typical to imagine that our, or our arrival somewhere is the beginning of the story. It's not nearly as self-absorbed as it sounds. It's kind of the typical way we evaluate things. Um, we, we wrongly, many of us, imagine that when Columbus arrived, it was the beginning of the story of North America. We're a little better informed today. Um, when I arrived in Murfreesboro, it established my insight into the history of this community. I can tell you what it was like really well from that point forward. That's the important part. It's the part that's affected me the most. And in a very similar way, we imagine that our congregation has always been the church we found when we arrived here. It's always looked like this no matter when you arrived here. You know, you still hear me describe it as a little country church. I'm not really trying to be coy in my imagination. It still kind of falls into that bucket because there was a lot invested in that season and that time and that place. And the things that I, the, the invitation that God put before me began in that place. And it didn't get revisited because another hundred people arrived. I can tell you this. The story of our congregation is a story of prayer and sacrifice and the efforts of God's people. You need to understand if you don't, church is a people initiative. It's about a group of people under the authority of Jesus, led by the Holy Spirit. That's not just our congregation. That's true of every vital, vibrant, God-honoring congregation. This just happens to be the place God has planted us to work together. We're not nomads. The Bible talks about us being a body and under authority. And if you're not under authority, you'll never reach maturity in the Lord. You don't need a congregation to make a profession of faith. You've heard me say it many times. You can do that in the produce section at the local grocery store. But you do need a community of faith in order to reach maturity. That is biblical. Because it's in that life together that we grow and learn and learn to serve and to honor one another. 
Uh, I have shared with you over these past few weeks, we've done several meetings, dozens of them, our plans for the expansion of our campus and our facilities. In the simplest possible language, it's just an upgrade of the tools with which we can do ministry. We don't worship buildings. Buildings don't make us holy or not. They don't make us more godly or less. Buildings are tools, and if you have the right tools, you can accomplish the task far more effectively. You know that's true. If the assignment is to mow the grass, and I have a pair of scissors, and you have a lawnmower, you have an advantage. It has nothing to do with sincerity or diligence or even the effort involved. Tools make a difference, and that's true for church as well. Sometimes we get a little fuzzy on our language around those things. If you haven't been to one of those information meetings, you can go to the website, and the Sanctuary of Scripture landing page will take you to a, the Wednesday night service from a week ago, and I, I walk through the entire plan there. But what I've asked you to do in this season is simply to pray about your role in that. It's a three-year initiative, the, the capital funding of that. We've asked you to be, consider giving above and beyond your normal pattern of giving. I recognize that's a sacrifice. But I don't apologize for ac asking you to make a sacrifice for the kingdom of God. I don't believe we ever make progress or enjoy success unless there's a sacrifice attached to it. Uh, if you succeed without a sacrifice, I promise you, somebody sacrificed in order for you to enjoy that success. Our nation needs to have that explained to them. Yeah, I could get off track. <laughs> what I have asked you to pray about is a sacrificial investment, is an offering to God. Um, March 11th, 12th, and 15th, it's a few weeks away, that's commitment week, in those services on Saturday and Sunday and then Wednesday, we will invite you to make those commitments. And then based on the outcome of that, we'll make our plans for going forward. It is an important time for us. We won't revisit it in August. We won't rewind it and try again. What we are becoming will be determined by some of the choices that we're going to make over these next few weeks. So it's an exercise in listening to the Lord. Nobody will tell you what to give, nobody should. But I would invite you to consider it. I assure you, if you've come since we've done a project, it's been 15 years since we expanded the buildings. There are many people who made a sacrifice before you came. If you've been involved on this journey with us for several years, you've been asked to do this before. I would put a question to you. Has God honored his part of that bargain? If he has, it should make your decisions simpler this time. You have a track record. Where do we get the notion that we will walk through our lives without making consistent sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom of God? Not from scripture. So it's an exciting time for us in the midst of all the darkness and the goofiness and the craziness. God's invited us forward. I consider it a privilege and an honor. And I pray that as you take the time to ask the Lord about your involvement, that you will do the same. We will celebrate together the faithfulness of God. If you haven't yet, take a few minutes to walk through the building. Start over in the atrium. It's all the way on the other side of the courtyard. That's kind of the first chapters of the story. And all through the building, there's some smaller pictures with some brief explanations. Take you a few minutes to read them all. But it's really a lesson in discipleship. It's a lesson in the unfolding story of the people of God. Every congregation is not the same, nor should they be. Every story isn't identical. But every time you can read a story about the faithfulness of God in the midst of his people, you will gain strength. And that's why we're here. We're not here just to get a biblical education. We wouldn't call that a church. We'd call it a school. We're here to try to understand what it means to be the people of God and see the name of Jesus lifted up where he has planted us and where he opens the doors. Amen. And I thank you for your faithfulness in that. All right. And I'm sure they'll find another embarrassing video to show you before we're done. And then I'm going to erase them all. You should have been given an outline for our lesson. We've been working through a series under the title of Determined Faith. And in this particular session, I want to talk with you about risk, reward, and judgment. Risk, reward, and judgment. I was invited to a small group, not uncommon for me. Uh, I don't get to do as much as I once did, but this was some months back. It wasn't a long time ago, but it's been a few months. I was invited to a group, and I didn't know it when they gave me the invitation, but the group was embroiled in a debate. 
One side was dug in pretty deeply. And the other side, as I just listened when I got there, I think was really just trying to avoid the confrontation, so they invited me. <laughs> it was a question about the kingdom of God, and the loudest opinion around the table was that it was a socialist system, that everybody would receive the same outcome in the kingdom of God, that if you were born again, if you made a profession of faith, that when you stepped out of eternity into the kingdom of God, we all landed in the same space. No difference. Equity at its best. The idea was that if you were welcomed into the kingdom of God, that it was an all-inclusive resort. <laughs> that you'd have access to everything equally. There'd be no distinction or differentiation. There'd be no distinction between participants. And to be completely candid, I, I had very little impact on the discussion because they were too deeply entrenched to be overly interested in Scripture. Their opinions had taken the ascendant positions. <laughs> but I haven't forgotten that meeting. And ever since then, and it's been months and months now, as I've, I've, I've been doing the Bible reading with you, I keep making notes about this topic because I thought, wow, that was really deeply rooted in the hearts of those people, and there, there was no negotiation to be had. So I want to ask you some questions, and I really kind of want to unearth what you think. If you haven't thought about it intentionally, I'm going to ask you to with me for a few minutes, because it has a great deal of bearing on the kind of faith you will choose to live out, whether you'll have a determined faith or a passive faith or a casual faith or a courageous faith. I ask you some questions. Do you think it makes any difference if we serve God with enthusiasm or we're just ambivalent? Indifferent. Not pagan. Not blatantly immoral. Do you think it makes any difference if you serve God on purpose with intention or not so much? I'm going to ask several questions. You don't have to answer out loud. I don't want to start a debate in the room. That's not true. I probably am trying to start a debate in the room. Do you imagine there's any benefit to being fervent in your faith? Does God really pay attention to our responses? Do disobedience and obedience receive identical outcomes? You know, we're processing as a community of faith and expansion of ministry in the midst of a turbulent world, in a world where there's a lot of confusion and upheaval and a lot of stuff. What's the best response? Is there a single best response? Is it about quantity? Or quality? Should we tell as many people as possible? Or should we walk carefully with those who are present? They're all layers to similar questions. Well, I want to start with this notion of judgment. And I'm a little limited in time and scope in a single session, but I would remind you that in the New Testament, we're told that there are more than one judgment. That if you're a Christ follower... You'll be asked to give an accounting of your life, but it's not a judgment of destination. It's not a judgment of heaven or hell. It's an evaluation of the life you have led. Now, there is another judgment, and that's a judgment of destination. So as you're reading your New Testament, if you're just reading casually, you have to pay attention to know specifically or more specifically what's being discussed. But in 1 Corinthians, I chose the, the same book, and actually I chose the same chapter, because there's a unity of context. It's talking about the believers and our lives. It's a bit of a different perspective on judgment. In 1 Corinthians 3, in verse 8, it says, the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. There's a fight in the Corinthian church. They're arguing about who is better. Imagine that. Imagine church folks having an argument about who's best. That just seems like a fantasy to us, doesn't it? <laughs> and they were saying, well, I'm better because Apollos is the one who instructed us. And another said, no, no, we're better because Peter taught us. And another says, no, no, it was Paul that helped us. And so Paul's writing to them, and he said, the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. And each will be rewarded according to his own labor. So the implication is, what you choose to do with your life, the effort you invest, the energy you invest, is going to be responded to. 
Now here's the hurdle. It's the elephant in the room. We don't earn our way to heaven. You can't qualify. You, can't, you don't get a better seat because you endured more sermons. Sorry. <laughs> and with that, that idea has pretty much been drilled into us that it isn't about works. And that is absolutely true. The righteous are saved by faith. That it is a free gift. But then the question that has to be processed, once you have received the gift of salvation, what are you to do with that? Put it on the shelf and wait for the fulfillment of what's been explained to you? Do you engage with it? In my imagination, it's a little bit like being given a, a, a power tool, chainsaw. You have one. But it doesn't mean that all the trees that fall on your property will cut themselves up. Or that because you have the saw, no more trees will fall. You've simply been equipped to engage when the needs are present. And that feels like the idea that Paul is pushing towards the Corinthians. You're each going to be recorded, re rewarded according to your own labor. Same chapter, verse 12. If any man builds on this foundation, and the foundation that he identified in the preceding verses was Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm an expert builder. I laid a foundation with Jesus. And if any man builds on this foundation using gold or silver or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. The day will bring it to light. Now, that's an interesting collection of building materials. Gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or stubble. The, the simplest observation to me is that gold or silver uh, worth a great deal can be held in the palm of your hand. An equivalent amount of wood would fill many trucks. So it isn't always about what's apparent or most visible. Value is attached in different ways. And his, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, day is capitalized, it's the day of judgment. will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he'll receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Now, the implication to me seems very clear that our lives will be evaluated. And we're going to be rewarded accordingly for what we've done. Again, not for our destination. But I hope you'll see before we're finished that our opportunities in the, in the age to come, in the, in the realm that is before us, are going to be impacted by the choices we make in this current age. The choice isn't simply, I want to go to heaven. The choice is, how may I honor the Lord? Amen, Pastor. Again, it's not a judgment of destination. It is a judgment of faithfulness. Now, I understand how quickly that is often rejected. We push it aside. We don't want to think about it as if we're suggesting some sort of salvation by works. I'm not doing that. I'm not even intimating that. That isn't what I read. But, but what Paul said to the Corinthian church is the quality of your life is going to be evaluated by fire. I can take you to other passages and other verses. But I want to spend the balance of our time and focus on Matthew's presentation. Whenever you can stay with a single author, there's a unity of thought, a unity of language. There's a story being told, a message being delivered. And it's often easier to grasp. And there's a continuity when we can do that. And I believe Matthew provides for us, as a faithful reader, some lessons in significance that speak to this topic. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. Jesus is speaking, and he said, Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus introduced two categories, and they're both participants in the kingdom of heaven. 
And the one category, he said, are persons who teach others. He says they break the commandments and they teach others to do the same. He didn't say they'd be cast out. He said they're going to be labeled the least. He said, on the other hand, if you're obedient, if you practice and you teach others to practice them, you'll be called great. So Jesus said the option before is you could be in the kingdom of God and be the least of these. Not bad, but you could be included in the kingdom of God and see, be the greatest of these. If your answer is, look, I just want to get in the door. Why? Does it not matter to you? Does the response of the Lord to your life, is it really, are you that indifferent to it? Does a pass-fail grade, is that really the objective of your life? What fuels that? Is the allure of the world or the invitation to ungodliness so great that you're really looking for the minimal, day, minimal daily requirement? I remember years ago, I, I did a, a sermon around this. And I, I talked about the idea that, you know, there's, there are requirements for your health. You need so much of this vitamin and that vitamin or so much calcium or so much water or so much protein. And to be healthy, we, we try to at least take balance of nature. Please make it stop. <laughs> and if something's toxic, we don't want that, I hope. And yet when it comes to sin or ungodliness or immorality or worldliness, we're pretty intolerant of that. We don't want to be considered, you know, prudish or we don't want to be out of step. So I brought a bottle of bleach one Sunday to church. And I poured some in a little glass, and I said, you know, who's willing to drink an ounce for $100? And we were pretty much in agreement before we finished with the little illustration that we didn't want any. We understood it was destructive, corrosive, debilitating, deadly. And we just didn't want to ingest any of it. How is it we have become so casual with the things of God that we will talk about what we're invited to obedience to in Scripture as if we have the privilege of setting it aside or not. Look in Matthew 6. Jesus again. This is a part of his Sermon on the Mount. He said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust don't destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. Jesus gives us very specific instructions to store up for ourselves treasure in heaven. Which suggests to me it can be accomplished. Wow! That we can make choices in time that will result in us having invested heavily in the age to come. I read something like that, I think, I'd like to know more about that. I'm going to think about that more. I'm going to order my time and my energy and my effort to see to it that that becomes a part of my life portfolio. That's different than just being born again. That's different than just robotically coming to church and enduring the sermons and get on with the things that are really important. That's different than imagining you have this antagonistic relationship with Christian leadership so that you know, you're, you're trying to get by with the least, the least service, the least engagement, the least participation. You want to go to heaven, but you just don't want to be one of those people. I discovered something a couple weeks ago when I had the opportunity to participate in that news program and I was doing these interviews. Typically when I'm asked to do an interview with somebody in the media that I don't know and I'm the one that's being interviewed, I assume there's somewhat of an antagonistic nature to that relationship. There's a reason they've called, there's something they want to know. I don't know. You generally feel like it's my best interest is at heart. Well, I didn't think about that when I was asked to do the interview. And I, and I, you know, after the first person or the second or the third or the fourth, I thought, these people are reluctant. And honestly, I was in the middle of an interview with the governor of another state, 
And before we even got on, the, the press secretary came on and said, you can have three minutes. And there was a little negotiation. I think we ended up with eight minutes. But it was about three minutes into the interview when I, I realized that the governor recognized I wasn't looking for a gotcha moment. I didn't even do it on purpose. It was just kind of one of those godly accidents that happens to, happens to stupid people sometimes. <laughs> but I said something, and he realized I wasn't an antagonist, and his whole demeanor changed. He began to talk about his faith and talked about how he understood the the impact of faith in the way he was leading in a state and how he hoped that would, the, the tone of the interview changed completely. We got done, the PR guy stepped back on and said, the governor will interview with you anytime. <laughs> well, I would submit to you, we carry a little bit of that sense of antagonism, oftentimes into the relationships in our formal religious settings. What do you need? What do you want? What are you trying to get me to volunteer for? And we're trying to protect our calendars and our lives and keep ourselves secret. We certainly don't want anybody knowing what we're doing. Let's just get in and get out. We want to go. It's nobody's business. And Jesus is giving us this counsel to store up for ourselves treasure in heaven. The reason for the direction is also given. He said, the reason you want to do this, the reason you should think about doing this, he said, any investments you make in heaven, I'm not talking principally about your money. He said, it can't be diminished. The market changes in heaven aren't going to take it away. Amen. It won't deteriorate. There's no inflation. Amen. He said, work on your treasure in heaven. This was Jesus' counsel to us. Now, I'll tell you what I've discovered about myself and others is what you treasure directs your heart. In most all of our cases, if you review our spending habits and our calendars, you can tell what we treasure. Forget the words. Look at Matthew 19. This is a little longer passage, and it's in kind of three different segments. So I broke it in your notes, but they're all related. A man came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good, and if you want to enter life, obey the commandments. The man inquired, well, which ones? <laughs> God bless us. And Jesus answered him. He's playing along. The patience of Jesus amazes me. Well, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. You've heard about those. We used to put them in schools. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, all these I have kept. Now, because Jesus was gracious, he didn't laugh at him. What do I still lack? And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. And you'll have treasure in heaven. Now, I don't believe the only way to get treasure in heaven is to liquidate your assets and give it to the poor. But in the context of this man's life, Jesus understood what was at the center of his person. Then come follow me. He was given the invitation of a lifetime. Get over there with Matthew and Pete and James and John. Come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad. He had great wealth. It wasn't immoral. It wasn't ungodly. He's a leader. has a lot of momentum in his life. He recognizes Jesus as an authority enough that he comes to inquire of him. He listens to him as a respected rabbi. And when Jesus gives him his answer, he rejects it. He imagines he can do it without that. He's going to go see if he can't build his own resume, his own portfolio. If he can't accumulate enough treasure in the current realm, that he can influence the attitudes in the realm to come. That's a very common attitude. It stretches across human history. It stretches across the history of the church. It is very prominent in the world today. That if you have enough success in this current world order, that it should give you some influence in the world to come. Because you can negotiate a deal or build a building or whatever your expertise may be, you imagine that God is anxious to get your help in what he's doing. Well, the disciples are distressed by this. They say, look, if he can't make it, who's, what hope is there for the rest of us? 
Same conversation. Jesus said to the disciples, I tell you the truth. And when you hear that, right? You don't just put your seatbelt on, you need the shoulder harness because you're about to come to a sudden stop, a reorientation. I tell you the truth, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, he repeats it. In, in the languages of scripture, repetition is a means of emphasis. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's not the eye of a sewing needle. It's a tight place in the path where a camel would pass. And to get the camel through the eye of the needle, you have to take the packs off. You have to get the camel down on their knees. They are grumpy beasts. It's a lot of work, a lot of effort. It's a detour that's going to take tremendous effort. And he said it, it's easier to do that with a camel than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So twice in these two verses, Jesus has said, the more affluent we are, the more difficult it is to enter the kingdom. He should have our attention. We're the most affluent people on planet Earth. We have more than any people who've ever existed. It's the reason hundreds of thousands of people a month are pouring over our border. It's not because we're cute. We take it for granted. We are wrongly told that the rest of the world lives like we do. It's just not true. We are a blessed people. So what Jesus is saying is very much directed at us. I know you don't imagine yourself to be affluent or rich or wealthy. That's always someone else. But I assure you by a global evaluation, the least amongst us is wealthy. And we should hear what Jesus is saying. It's a cautionary tale. He said it's more difficult for us because we can solve most of our problems. The health care is free. The schools are free. We have transportation. There's food to eat. It may not be the food you want, but there's food to eat. There's too much of us. We have so much stuff, we have to rent places to put it. They're everywhere. So we, we, we very seldom come to desperate points. We come to desperate points sometimes when there's a, a breach in a family system or a breach in our health, and the, the scientific community can't help us or the healthcare community can't help us, but, but we avoid desperation. Much of the world leads desperate lives. I talk to the pastors in Ukraine. I have friends in other places in the world. I have a friend who said to me one time, it's been years ago now, but he said, Pastor, he said, Alan, he told me Pastor. He said, in the United States, he said, you work to recreate, to have your time off, to vacation, to do the things you want to do with your families so your children can be engaged in sports. He said, in my country, we work to survive. So Jesus is speaking to us. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. It's a paradigm adjustment for them. They said, well, then who could be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, we've been given a little bit of assignment if you've heard Jesus. We're going to have to have a little conversation with him. Lord, I have so much. I live well, and I eat well, and I travel well, and I have opportunities, and I, I get to choose a future and plan it out to the point that I get upset when my plans don't work out. But I don't want to miss your invitations. I don't want to be deaf to what you're saying. I want to cooperate with you. We only make one journey through time, folks. You don't get to do this again. I'm amazed at the counsel I hear Christians give to people sometimes. I hear them say to young people, oh, so your wild oats. Go have a good time. If by that you're giving them license to be ungodly, Jesus has already spoken to you. We just read it. You're going to be the least of these. You only get one chance to honor the Lord as a teenager. Go ring the bell for Jesus. You're only going to college one time, I hope, as a Christ follower. It's not an eight-year plan for your undergraduate degree. Go be godly in the midst of that. You're only going to do, do business to honor the Lord. Well, I would forfeit something. Not in the eternal kingdom of God. Lay up some treasure in heaven. Tell the truth. Make a fair profit. 
give a fair day's work for a fair day's wage and pay a fair wage for somebody who works a fair day. Stop with the foolishness. Lord, forgive us. We've been too casual with this. We said, well, I'm not one of the one percenters. Oh, yes, we are. If, if you get the pool out there big enough, it's us. Well, I don't feel like one. Oh. Stuff doesn't make you happy. We can all give a testimony. You know, I've had none, and I've had the little. The little's better. Poverty's a curse. But Jesus isn't done. Same passage, same context, same discussion. Peter answered him, we've left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? you got to love Peter. He just says what everybody else thinks. He said, all right, Lord, if it's this camel and the, knee, and the needle and the, it's hard. And he said, we left everything. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. At the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. First of all, we're not all going to get the same outcome. There's 12 tribes, 12 thrones, and you were just told, Jesus just told you who's going to occupy them. But then he broadened the conversation. And we were invited into the discussion. He said, everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake will receive 100 times as much and inherit eternal life. You know the most difficult place to live your faith out? kitchen table. I've had this conversation dozens and dozens of times in the last year with church leaders across the country. More than one have looked at me and said, Pastor, that's just really hard. That's really hard. I've had the conversation in this community and they say, no, that's just, that's pretty tough to have to do to, to tell your adult kids they're, they're leading ungodly lives. That's going to impact holidays. It's going to introduce some disruption. How many times have we tolerated, encouraged, supported, affirmed ungodliness, wickedness, immorality? We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be condemning. We don't have to be belligerent. For heavenly, don't be violent. But we have to do what Jesus said. Jesus had the courage to tell us the truth. We have to have the courage to tell the truth. That's not my wisdom. Jesus said it's going to have a bearing on our status, on, on, on our trustworthiness. See, it's easy to go some other country. Stand in front of a group of people you don't know, you'll never see again. You can be really, really bad for Jesus. I mean, you can drop the hammer. It's far more difficult to do with the people you do life with. Folks, the, the, the change needs to come within the church. We'll see the culture change. Matthew 20. I love Matthew's honesty. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons. Do you know who Zebedee's sons are? James and John. Jesus' best friend. And she knelt down and asked Jesus for a favor. And he said, well, what is it you want? And she said, grant that one of these sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. Well, there you go. <laughs> she didn't even wait for a private moment. The rest of the disciples are all hanging out. And mom rolls in and says, I've got a favor to ask. <laughs> and Jesus said, yes. And she said, I'd like my boys to be on either side of you in your kingdom. Well, you might as well just swing for the fences, Mom. <laughs> I'm amazed at Jesus' answer. 
Grant that one of these sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left. Then Jesus said to them, to them, not to her, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? That is a very serious question. And they answered, we can. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. I think it's safe to say from that passage that there will be different assignments and different opportunities in the age to come. Jesus didn't look at them and say, oh, everybody's going to rotate through those seats. Everybody gets a day on my right and everybody gets a day on my left. It's like musical chairs. We're just going to keep circling. He said, no, to even be considered in the conversation, you'd have to share the cup I'm going to drink. Can you do that? And they said, mm-hmm. And Jesus said, duly noted. We're not finished. Matthew 25. Matthew 24, some of you will remember, is the most lengthy prophetic discourse of Jesus' public ministry. He describes the end of this age and the circumstances in the world prior to his return. And Matthew 25 is really a continuation of that discussion. He begins to describe the groups of people that will be involved in that. And in Matthew 25 and verse 14, he says again, his kingdom will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants entrusted his property to them. And to one he gave five talents of money, and to another two talents, and to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey, and the man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. And so also the one with the two talents gained two more, but the man who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now the most obvious, I think most of you are familiar with that parable. Jesus comes back and re rewards them for what they have done. I think it is a, a, a picture of a judgment of our lives and what we have done in time. But we, we would note, first of all, that they were given different gifts and talents. It's not all the same. What they're asked is to be faithful. One of the more destructive things you can do is spend your life in comparative analysis. You can be angry at people who have talents that you don't. You can feel demeaned and cheated by people who have things that you don't. You can spend your life filled with envy and covetousness as a Christ follower. You can give expression to those carnal things and greatly diminish the impact you can have in time. Or you can give yourself license to be more ungodly because you feel like the circumstances that define you were less than what you thought they should be or you would have preferred them to be. And your response is to be less enthusiastic for the Lord? We're given different gifts and talents. The analogy that's used in the New Testament, I didn't put the passages here, but you can look, it's in Corinthians, is the analogy of a body. And Paul said to the church in Corinth the, that the eye can't say to the foot, you're not a part of the body. Again, it's the idea that we have different gifts and abilities, but we all matter to God. We may be valued differently by culture or society. We may be willing to pay athletes far more than we're willing to pay teachers. Don't be angered by that. Recognize the difference. And if, if God's invited you to be a teacher, teach with great enthusiasm. If he's called you, given you the gifts to be an athlete, go cash the check and be godly. We'll be judged and rewarded for what we have done with our gifts and our opportunities. It's the loud language of that parable. Do we use our gifts for the kingdom of God or do we use them for ourselves? It's a very important question. I can't tell you how many people I have met through the years that have the imagination. They want to do everything they can do to maximize their gifts and the talents and abilities and 
whatever they may be, and that at some point in the future, they're going to begin to consider God. I would say that is the more typical response, that giving God permission to interrupt your pursuit God doesn't need my accomplishments nearly as much as he needs my faithfulness. So let me wrap this up with a summary. I gave you some observations that I've taken from those Matthew passages. There are a variety of opportunities within the kingdom of God. It's not all the same. And who you are and what you do in time will determine a great deal about your role in eternity. I'm not talking about heaven or hell. Secondly, Jesus told us that now we can invest in eternity. It was Matthew 6. He said we can lay up treasure in heaven now. You want to figure that out. That's better than any dollar cost averaging scheme you've got for this present age. The third one is that wealth or success, if you prefer that word, presents a threat to a significant life in the kingdom of God. So if you recognize you've been given that ability to accumulate or to achieve, it should be a cautionary note. We're going to have to be even more intentional in order to lead a life of significance in the kingdom of God. It's going to be more difficult. There will be unique temptations. Pride, your carnality, the opportunities put before you to think of yourself more highly than you ought will be easy. Number four, our ambition has to be carefully focused. We learn that from the label in Scripture is the mother of Zebedee's sons. But you get a feeling the boys have been involved in the discussion. Ambition's not evil. Philippians chapter 2 said that our ambition should be to have the attitude that Jesus had. We shouldn't be driven by selfish ambition, but ambition is important. We have a culture right now that has become so idolatrous with the government, we have lost ambition. We think it should just accumulate, accrue to us. Somebody, it should be given to us. Somebody has something they shouldn't, and we should be given some of it. That is evil. And it's a lie being used to manipulate you. But our ambition has to be very carefully focused. There's an almost... An, Several verses in Philippians chapter 2 walk you through Jesus' attitude. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient, obedient even to the point of death. There's the pathway for us. The more talented, the more determined you have to be to humble yourself and be obedient. The more successful, the more intentional you have to be. Number five. There are rewards, or if you prefer, responses for the life we choose to lead in time. The, the, the most candid answer about that is there's a cost in following Jesus. Jesus. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's open to any person who will come. But Jesus told us in the plainest of language, if we're going to be his disciple, we have to take up our cross daily and follow him. It's not just a Bible study. It's not just information collection. There's a uniqueness that comes with that. You'll have to be willing to be a part different. Not weird different. Godly different. Number six... Outcomes are required. In the, in the parable, in the terrible of the talents, in the parable of the talents, <laughs> the, the servant who had the one talent, remember what he did? He went and buried it. And he presented it, and I said, I knew you could be a difficult evaluator. And I didn't want to lose anything. I didn't want to take any risk. So I brought you what you gave me intact. Remember the response? You wicked, lazy servant. You knew I was a hard evaluator, did you? You should have at least brought interest on what you were given. You wouldn't have had to work for interest. You could have been absorbed with your own selfish agenda and received interest. 
take what he has and give it to somebody else and cast him into outer darkness. Outcomes are required of our lives. In Philippians chapter 2, if we go back to that passage, it says, because of what Jesus did, God gave him the name that's above every name. That every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The perfect, sinless, obedient Son of God was asked to accept an assignment, the incarnation, to put on an earth suit and come and understand the frailty and the vulnerability of the human experience and then willingly take upon himself the punishment for our ungodliness. Do you think you and I are going to become Christ followers and serve the Lord in our journey through time in the context of a picnic and a parade and a promotion? Are there blessings for serving the Lord? Absolutely. But there's a cost. And then number seven, spiritual awareness is required to discern the opportunities. You see, we have to willingly, intentionally cultivate this awareness of a spiritual life. We've imagined that we could push that off until we're, we step into eternity, but right now we just want to be fully engaged in the world. We spend more time trying to understand the ungodly so we can build a bridge to them than understanding righteousness and holiness and purity so that we can display that in such an appealing way that the ungodly will want it. We have to be different. We've been intrigued with the license that has come with compassion for the ungodly. And we have shunned the call to righteousness and holiness and purity. But God is awakening us and he's calling us back. Folks, there is a reward for honoring God with your life. Don't forfeit that. When you have the opportunity to, to acknowledge that you know Jesus in the marketplace, embrace it. When you have an opportunity to honor the goodness of God and in your family system, be thankful for it. When you have the opportunity in the bleachers at the ball game while you're watching the kids or the grandkids on the sports fields, talk about Jesus. There's a reward for that. Well, I don't want any reward. I just want to go to heaven. Oh, stop it. Stop using nonsense, nonsense language and then saying Jesus at the end of it. That's like saying, I go to work, I don't want to be paid for it, I just enjoy hanging out with people. <laughs> we came back from Bridgestone Arena. I'm done. How much? Yeah, I am done. We went to Bridgestone and did an event, and I don't know how many people. We had a, we had a lot of people over there, and we came back, and somebody stopped me in the lobby and said, Pastor, it was worth it if one person heard the gospel. We worked for weeks, weeks, and weeks. We loaded, I forget, 28, 30 buses of people that went to Nashville from here. I said, no, I wasn't. <laughs> and they looked, the eyes got big. And I said, if only one person needed to hear the gospel, I'd have gone to the mall. <laughs> I took evangelism explosion training. I know the two diagnostic questions. I'll go do the interview. we will get one person to hear the gospel tonight. And I could have had eight weeks back. We went to Bridgestone for a much larger cause. See, we've adopted the spiritual equivalent of word salad. We don't like it in others. Let's not do it ourselves. We need a higher heightened spiritual awareness in order to engage the opportunities around us. The Spirit of God is moving in the earth. There are some risks involved when you run your hand up and say, I'm for Jesus, but there are some amazing rewards, and God is a just judge. Amen. Nothing you entrust to him, nothing you give to him, no statement of affirmation on his behalf, no matter how violent the pushback against it, will be overlooked or lost. You can trust him. Lay up treasure in heaven. You won't regret it. I brought you a prayer. I've really enjoyed the family prayer guide that's been a part of this Sanctuary of Scripture initiative. If you haven't found it yet, you're missing out. I would encourage you to pray with your family or with whomever you pray regularly, but I brought you the prayer for the first prayer for the third week. Why don't you stand with me? We'll pray it together. I like being a part of people who are learning to pray. 
We're going to do 24 hours of prayer before we get to the end of this. The Friday night and through the Saturday evening service. What is that? March to the 10th into the 11th. Even with new math. We'll talk more about it. Let's pray this prayer together. Lord, forgive us for the casual way we have approached you about expanding your kingdom. Show us how we can be a part of your purposes. Awaken your church and use us as instruments to bring about your glory in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.